Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over exactly what you need to know and be able to do for the waves topic in the advanced higher physics course. So let's get into it. Now the SQA split the waves topic into three key areas. So we have waves, we have interference, and we have polarization. So we're going to go through each of these in turn and see what you need to know. So for the first subtopic waves, you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving the energy transferred by a wave and its amplitude. So we have the energy E equals Ka squared where K is a constant and A is the amplitude. And remember you can form an equation from this one in terms of the variables 1 and 2. So if you rearrange this to get the constant on its own, you can divide both sides by A squared to get E divided by A squared equals K, the constant. And that means that you could write the E1 divided by A1 squared is equal to E2 divided by A2 squared. It then says to know the mathematical representation of travelling waves. And this is given down here, so you need to be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving wave motion, phase difference and phase angle. So here's your travelling wave equation y equals a sine 2 pi times ft minus x over lambda, and this is the one for phase difference. Where y is displacement, a is amplitude, f is frequency, t is time, x is distance, and lambda is wavelength. And then we have this equation for phase difference phi, which is 2 pi x over lambda, where x is the distance between two points in a wave, and lambda is the wavelength. And lastly for section 1, you need to know that stationary waves are formed by the interference of two waves of the same frequency and amplitude travelling in opposite directions. A stationary wave can be described in terms of nodes and antinodes where your nodes are points of zero amplitude or zero disturbance, and your antinodes are points of maximum amplitude or maximum disturbance. Moving on to the second key area, interference. Firstly, you need to know that two waves are coherent if they have a constant phase relationship. And remember, this means the waves will have the same speed, frequency, and wavelength. You also need to know the conditions for constructive and destructive interference in terms of coherence and phase. So remember we can only get interference, i.e. constructive and destructive interference, if the waves are coherent. If they're not, then we won't get an interference pattern produced. And for phase, remember constructive interference occurs when two waves meet in phase, whereas destructive interference occurs when two waves meet out of phase. And you could also describe it in terms of crests and troughs. So you could say constructive interference occurs when a crest meets a crest, or a trough meets a trough, and you could say that destructive interference occurs when a crest meets a trough. It then says you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving optical path difference OPD, geometrical path difference GPD, and refractive index, where we say the optical path difference is equal to the refractive index times the geometrical path difference. You should also know that a wave experiences a phase change of pi radians when it's travelling in a less dense medium and reflects from an interface with a more dense medium, so that could be light when it's going from air to glass for example. Whereas you should also know that a wave does not experience a phase change when it's travelling in a more dense medium and reflects from an interface with a less dense medium, and that could be light that's already in the glass, reflecting off a glass air boundary. Next it says to explain interference by division of amplitude, including optical path length, geometrical path length, phase difference and optical path difference. Moving on, it says you need to have knowledge of thin film interference and wedge fringes. And we looked at these as applications of interference by division of amplitude. It then says for light interfering by division of amplitude, use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving the optical path difference between waves, wavelength and order number. So you should know the optical path difference equals m lambda or m plus a half lambda where m equals 0, 1, 2 and so on, i.e. where m is an integer. And we would use optical path difference equals m lambda for maxima or constructive interference, and optical path difference equals m plus a half lambda for minima or destructive interference. Next it says to know that a coated or bloomed lens can be made non-reflective for a specific wavelength of light. And you also need to be able to derive the relationship d equals lambda over 4n for glass lenses with a coating such as magnesium fluoride, where d is the thickness of the lens coating, lambda is the wavelength of the light, and n is the refractive index of the coating. And this was the equation we derived in the theory video for blooming of lenses. Next, you need to be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving interference of waves by division of amplitude. So this is the equation here for thin wedge interference, delta x equals lambda L over 2d, where delta x is the fringe spacing, lambda is the wavelength of the light, L is the length of the microscope slides, and d is the thickness of the object at one end of the air wedge. And then we have our equation for the anti-reflective coatings, d equals lambda over 4n. Moving on, it says to explain interference by division of wavefront. And remember that's all to do with Young's double slit experiment. So you need to have knowledge of Young's slit's interference which is just the Young's double slit experiment. And remember an example of that is passing laser light through a double slit and observing an interference pattern on a screen. And lastly, you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving interference of waves by division of wavefront. And this is our equation for Young's double slit experiment, delta x equals lambda d over d, where delta x is the fringe spacing, lambda is wavelength, capital D is the distance between the slits and the screen, and little d is the slit separation. 
Lastly, our final key area for waves is polarization. So firstly, you need to know what is meant by a plane polarized wave. And remember, this is when light has electric field oscillations in one plane only. It then says to know the effect on light of polarizers and analyzers. Well, if you have a combination of two polarizers, you call the first one a polarizer and the second one an analyzer. And if you pass light through a polarizer, it's going to be plane polarized. So the light is going to be polarized in one plane only, either the vertical plane or the horizontal plane usually. And if you then take your second polarizer, i.e. your analyzer, and you try and observe the plane polarized light through your first polarizer, then if you have your analyzer in the same orientation as the first polarizer, then the light will be completely bright and will be completely transmitted through your analyzer. However, if you rotate your analyzer through 90 degrees, the brightness of the light that you see will decrease and decrease until it goes completely dark. And at that point, the analyzer has completely blocked the light. However, if you then rotate the analyzer through another 90 degrees, you'll eventually get back to full brightness. Moving on, it says to know that when a ray of unpolarized light is instant on the surface of an insulator at Brewster's angle, the reflected ray becomes plane polarized. And the two insulators we mentioned in the notes were water and a glass surface. So this is basically getting at the idea of your Brewster's angle definition. And Brewster's angle, remember, is the angle of instance which causes the angle of refraction to be 90 degrees between the reflected and the refracted rays. Next, you need to be able to derive the relationship n equals tan ip, which relates the refractive index n to Brewster's angle ip. And remember we did this in the theory video for polarization by reflection, where we made use of an equation from higher physics, n equals sine theta 1 over sine theta 2, to derive this. Lastly, you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving Brewster's angle and refractive index. So you need to be able to use this equation where you're either going to be given Brewster's angle and need to work out the refractive index, or you're going to be given the refractive index for the material and asked to calculate Brewster's angle instead. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching, if you made it to the end I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.